need it. Yeah. I don't know. There's always people waiting. We don't need to count down. Bless, bless the waiting audience <laughs> if they like the countdown because we're live. Yeah, it's a uh, so I don't actually do the countdown for the audience to show up. I do the countdown because it says you're live, but you're not actually live. There's a there's a pause. Yeah, it's there's like ten delay. seconds though. It can yeah. be up to ten seconds. So yeah, you, you just sit there like stare silently. And welcome to Vlog Thursday number three hundred seventy eight, where we just kind of. You know, hit live in mid sentence. Yeah. We were debating whether or not we hit the countdown timer. Oh, I never hit it. I mean, you never hit the countdown. Timer. I never hit it. On business technicalities, I always hit it. Yeah. Until I don't. <laughs> it's the thing. It happens. Um, me and G start noodling something around. So we'll put it at the beginning of here for those of you that don't always watch the entire live stream. Also, we have a hard stop at three, right? Yes. Yep. I mean, you can keep going. I have a hard stop. Well, at if I don't stop at three, I got to hit traffic later. And I don't, yeah, I'd rather leave at three where I don't have to hit traffic because there's freeway issues. Anyways, uh, we're going to set up probably a form on the site. We want to do free tech supports like on we'll do a Friday. Yeah, yeah. if it's every other Friday, we'll figure it out on the cadence. Uh, but we want to be able to have a form for people who want to get our opinion on the solutions uh, that we talk about or things like that, whether it's TrueNAS, a network engineering question, a storage question, hypervisor questions, uh, setups. So we want to like you know, and take these forms. Uh, you can decide whether or not you want your name used in there. You'll we'll have it all filled out like yes. that. And then uh, we'll read through it and walk through our idea for a solution uh, based on the scenario given to us. Now, of note, we will, what do what the uh, investment people say? Not investment advice? Yeah, yeah not well, legal advice. Not, not legal advice. advice. Yeah, yeah, not legal advice, not investment advice. A Two people with some experience here going through our ideas for things, but uh, this is not a guarantee that this is the perfect solutions for you. But we want to walk people through the process and get them exposed to some of those ideas. Um, so what else? I see everyone afternoon. Jamaica. Awesome. Someone yeah, from Norway. All right. Uh, see, so I haven't gotten glasses yet, so I pulled my phone up so I can see the comments. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to make them bigger? No, it's fine. <laughs> Um, but something else and where that photo that was in the thumbnails from is, uh, the Wi-Fi assessment, which you did yesterday in terms of shipping it. I think I, yeah, I gave it to Trev yesterday. I don't know if he actually shipped it. Okay. I'll, I will, he's here. So I'll ask him. Yeah. Uh, we have a video I recorded of us doing a Wi-Fi assessment. We came in, we saw, we found overlapping channels. We found overlapping <laughs> channels. We found, uh, overzealous power tuning. We found, uh, what, what did I say? We could hear 360 some odd access points standing mm -hmm. in that main area. It's yeah. What happens when you're in downtown New York? It was in New York. The, yeah. Over 300 other access points um, driving driving yeah. the Wi-Fi crazy. Uh, and loops in the network. That's uh, maybe we think. I'm pretty confident. I'm, almost, I'm pretty. I'm fairly confident too. Yeah. Mystery devices. Mystery devices. Actually, that's what we've got. Is well, this is a DevOps handbook. Over there's all the other ones. Yeah. Um, we've just been talking about that for building out the lab here. Today was our all hands meeting. Uh, we talked more about the business side of things here at CNWR on the Business Technicalities channel, which you'll find linked in the description. But uh, I want to. I think it'd be some good video content and certainly some good troubleshooting content of putting mystery switches in. Uh, and letting the team find them. No, no. Got, I got way better with mystery switches. We can find some mystery hubs. Mystery hubs. Oh <laughs> man, better. mystery hubs are way more fun. Oh yeah. Uh, that was because that was one of the challenges we had at the client was some of the problems they were having had nothing to do with Wi-Fi and everything to do with probably network problems with the. I mean, there was like two terabytes of receive only, but yeah, no transmit. No transmit. Yeah, we're like yeah, that was interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I think the one uh, the one interface had 14 million broadcast packets received on it. Yeah, and I'm like that's a lot of broadcast. Packets. There's a lot of broadcast for not many people here. We, um, could, we could also just layer two bridge over a random T1 we insert in the network. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you really mean? Mm -hmm. <sighs> um, we are not using Ikua. What is uh, the software using? It's Yukahau, uh, we're, I'm using Tamagraph. Tamagraph. Uh, I, I'd like to use Yukahau. Uh, so if Yukahau happens to see this and wants to sponsor, uh, it's very expensive. It's yeah. awesome, but it's very expensive. Yeah. Um, we would like to use a few different things. And I know they're reaching out to uh, people who do YouTube videos. So I figure after I do the YouTube video, it'll be my impetus to go, here's the video we did. Yeah. We'll do another one with your product if you send me your product. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we do a couple of these a year, right? So it's not been enough of them to justify the 
the bundle that we'll end up buying if I buy Yukaha is like 13 grand. So it's probably not enough to justify 13,000. Yeah, it's just, it, it's kind of expensive. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a thing, but I will uh, do a whole video on the Wi Fi survey thing and it's going to be kind of a fun video. We're going to walk through. I filmed some of the stuff. We have permission uh, from the client to talk about everything. So we can highlight that. Um, I just fought through my first ar <laughs> four into harvester. Uh, so why do you guys think Susie won't automatically see and boot? Uh, I don't know. I Harvester seems overly complicated. And, and the only people who have ever asked me about using a harvester as a hypervisor are people who use, uh, use it in home lab. Maybe it's good for the home environment. I have seen zero. Yeah, I've uh, never even heard of it until this very moment. Yeah, it's by OpenSUSE. It's kind of like, mm. I don't think it has near the features. It looks very <laughs> barren. Yeah. Uh, you said the magic words there. It's, uh, yeah, I tried to like SUSE. I tried. I, yeah, I've never got in. I've never I got just, into it. I couldn't get there. So, I mean, it probably works. It looks like it's just Kubernetes on top of, yeah. Cody, thank you. Yeah, uh, send me. Well, you know how to get a hold of me. Me and me. I mean, Cody's got my phone number. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Me. Sidekick two is what I want. Oh, perfect. So, yeah. uh, did, they shipped him one, so they'll ship yeah. us one. Perfect. Cool. Problem solved. All we had to do is there. Proxmox versus VMware. Proxmox is better than VMware. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, it depends on the use case. Yeah, we've we've kind of doubled down on XCPNG overall for some of these large installs. Yeah. Uh, I just did another consulting call. We just put a bid together for almost six hundred thousand uh, dollars for a migration. So we definitely are doubling down on XCPNG for the large scale deployments. But uh, we have a Proxmox in a lab here. We have two of them. I have one in my lab, and there's one at the lab here in this office. I still don't have. Yeah, and I have a Proxmox. I have a Proxmox of VMware and two XCPNGs at home right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is I still don't have a good solution for vSAN. Uh, I know, I think XCPNG is getting close. Yep. Uh, you, it, it works not in a hyper-converged. I, I noodled around a really hacky solution that we could potentially yeah. use to do it on the board. Tom cried a little inside. <laughs> basically, <laughs> It will work, but that's... 100% that's... it'll work. And <laughs> basically, run your base, uh, your base OS... Hardware exposed the controller to uh, for the drives to the a VM that runs Ceph on that VM ice or NFS mount back to the host to actually run your VMs. So, uh, yeah, but they're they're close. Um, I am probably going to spend some time talking to the team at Bates and set up a um, a lab demoing with their eight point because I think they've got it all set up so it works in eight point three now. Um, they're hyper commercial. I want to test it out. I want to start poking at it. Uh, and I want to build it to scale where I've got like five or six machines, not just yeah, three, yeah, yeah. um, and see how well it works. So it is on my to-do list. Cause I know they're getting close. They, they said it should be production ready this year for sure. They just didn't developers are developers. They don't want to tell you it'll be done when it's it'll done be when it's done. Yeah. We all love hearing that. Right. Uh, it seems like a Susie issue. I could, I couldn't get into it either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah until you hack the grub config so your hbs are still using them yeah i it, once i've seen people kind of talk about it, it doesn't feel like a, this when you compare it, proxmox or xcpng are very smooth solutions that even an amateur home labber can get them set up pretty easily like both of them are easy arguably proxmox with it with some exceptions of it just not liking some hardware which is weird because debian usually likes all the hardware I've had Proxmox problems where the installer runs but gets hung up and doesn't like the drives. Yeah, it's. I mean, that's exactly what he's facing there. They're yeah. just not shipping. They're shipping some subset of basically HCL uh, storage drivers. Right. Right. They so the ones they've tested and they know work. They're shipping and they're not shipping other things. So for home lab users, you tend to run into problems because the stuff they've tested is expensive. Right. A question for Tom. Installed EVNG inside of XCPNG. Uh, imported the MakerTik QCOW2. But whenever I start MakerTik in EVNG, the VM restarts. You know it could be enabled. So you do have nested virtualization enabled. I've never run EVNG. Did you ever use that? Or Yeah, you got me Googling a lot on this. I'm going to... It's gonna a, be, uh... EVNG is a pretty popular for, like network lab setup. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's like... A... God, what's that? Uh, GNS3. GNS3. Very or similar. Viral. Yeah, I use viral usually because I haven't used it. Um, I've always like MakerTik. When I wanted, when I started learning about MakerTik, I went and bought one of their hundred dollar switches. I know not everyone has a budget that they can just go buy a hundred dollar switch, but I just kind of like doing things at the physical. Yeah. Obviously, uh, that's harder with some of the expensive Cisco gear uh, that's really high end because you're 
Yeah, I've so when that's happened to me in the past, uh, it's usually the some sort of CPU feature at once that isn't being exposed. Right. So yeah. like if they so apparently x86 has version levels now, I, that's yeah, uh, I've been reading about that somehow that uh, Linux news article place that starts with P is stalking me on Google News. Like all of my Google News is oh. like that. Uh, I forget <laughs> what the name of the, the thing is. Yeah, but I've been reading a lot about uh, the various vendors targeting various levels of x86 and so if they're compiled with like x86 v3 which assumes you have i think avx 512 and you don't have avx 512 then it just explodes and dies in a ball of flames and it's possible that xcpng isn't exposing all the cpu flags to maintain compatibility and i would check something along those lines honestly yeah um that that avx extension also hangs up a few people because mongo the newer versions of mongo and this broke a bunch yeah. of people's unify which was had nothing to do with it uh, in terms of like they thought it was Unify promise that Mongo needs the AVX extension or it won't work. It it will. You just probably have to compile it from source. Oh yeah. The RPMs are shipping are accepting right. the AVX extension. Yeah, it's not that there's no way around yeah. it, but it's it's not the apt kit install way around we it. We need this to be fast. But right. Again, friends don't let friends run Mongo. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Unless it's Unify, in which case it's just an appliance that you don't actually have to maintain. Ish. Um, how to best migrate from VMware site one to XCV at site two? Cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Yeah. My, migrate from VMware at site one to XCPNG, XCPNG at site one and then ship machine to site two. Yeah. Well, we, we've been testing the migration tool and yeah. we've had, what, 80%? Pretty good success, yeah. It seems to not like snapshots. Okay, so if there's no uh, if there's snapshots attached, they should... It, it blows up if there's snapshots, and we have run into issues. Uh, it doesn't seem to like certain OBAs. Uh, so, mm. like the Ovid collector, we haven't been able to successfully do that. I mean, it's installed being an OBA or an OBF, right? Okay. So it doesn't seem to like appliances. But as far as, like, stuff you just install, it's worked very well. Yeah, the but the good news is, I mean, the one, like, the smoothness of it, when it works, yeah. it just works. And yeah. you're like, this is nice. I mean, there's, I cannot give you, I mean, need more info. Do you have 10 gig between site one and site two? Because if so, then yeah, this is easy. If you don't have 10 gig or even gig, then uh, there is probably not a zero downtime way to do this. Uh, XCB has some kernel issues. They are using an older kernel, um, but one of the nice things about XCPNG, it's their own repositories. So they're highly controlled. Um, that's, and it's not as simple as just bring in the latest six kernel and things like that because it, yeah. things break. <laughs> I mean, Proxmox is the same way. We, uh, what is the I226? Yeah. The Intel 226, like nothing, none of those virtualization things have support for that. Right. Uh, and, it, and this is true too. Uh, Proxmox doesn't like EMMC storage. That is what the problem you run into, and there's a, there's a workaround for it. You have to modify the installer because it actually doesn't want to install, not just not install an EMMC. One, one of the, uh, those, I don't know what that thing is. The one with the 210 gig, the little tiny computer I got, the weird yeah, one I reviewed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it has EMMC, it gives you an error that it can't install, even though I have a NVMe drive in it. Yeah. It was a bug in version 8.1, and now it's fixed in 8.2, or maybe it was 8.0 and it's fixed in 8.1. But when I first installed it, then I found I had to do a workaround to get it to install because it just says, we can't install. But I don't want you installing the EMMC. I want you yeah. installing the other one. It, and they're like, yeah, we don't do EMMC. It doesn't want you to install on removable storage is what I think it actually probably. And I think most EMMC presents itself as is like USB storage or some crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any recommendation for a TrueNAS backup server that will use all NAS SSD? I mean, just no. throw SS. I mean. Are you backing up to SSD or from SSD? Right. Any bits for any slog? Uh I mean, a slug helps if you need synchronous writes only. I did a whole video, right? It's a long video and people are like, that's a lot of video. I'm like, that's because there's so much explaining to what a slog is. It is not exactly a write cache. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of complexities in there. If you're just using it for a backup target, it does not need um, slog. Slog doesn't get used um, in replication. I would also question why you're doing a backup target to SSD. Yeah. I mean, unless you need a super fast recovery, generally backups, you save the money and put them on the spinning rust. Yeah. I mean, it is this a replication target and not a backup target? Cause that changes the right. calculus a little bit there. But as far as backup goes, I would 
backing up to SSD sounds like a lot of money. Like, sounds like you had enough money, you should just give us some. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think you need to back up to SSDs. Um, that might, might be a better forum question because we don't yeah. have the form yet for our uh, free tech support thing. These are going to be a lot of questions because like even uh, like the consulting call I did today was a lot of going over what would work and what wouldn't work. They have a reasonable budget, but the budget is going to be stretched further because they're willing to get slightly off lease used hardware. Um, they're going to get some, I think they're what, seven Dell 740s are on the head end of their system. So, you know, it's reason. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I, that stuff gets a bad name. And like, we use SEI locally here, like, mm -hmm. but there's uh, Park Place, I think is another one. There's so many companies that will warranty that third party hardware. And yeah. what I really care about is an MSP putting the MSP head on there. I care about vendor support. I yep. care about the fact that I can call somebody and they come out and replace the motherboard on that thing when it fails, mm -hmm. or they ship me drives and they're willing, I'll, I'll we'll replace drives, but like, I'm not, I'll replace things that are field replaceable units that do not require me to direct the server. If it's beyond that, I want the vendor to come do it. Yeah. Well, and the nice thing is it's affordable when you go use because you can put a couple pool, couple in your uh, pool. So you even if it's just two of them, you've got a complete spare system sitting yeah. there. You join to the pool and you're like, cool, I could just move the VMs over here if the other one catastrophically fails. Yeah. Looking to keep power down in my home lab. Yeah. 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 Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, so I would not buy older used hardware in that case. That is the exception to the rule, uh, is that you tend the power tends to not be as good. Uh, yeah, I, I would say I love all these little mini PCs serve the home has reviewed a ton yeah. of great ones. I've reviewed just a handful of them, but I, they're awesome because even though Ah, we've had a few failures of them. We've had a non-zero number of failures of them for sure. Yeah. But they're so inexpensive. Um, the warranty does kind of suck on it, but the warranty sucks on the, the server hardware, yeah. but you can make it up in your power bill. If you live, you know, Michigan and I mentioned Ohio as well here, we have really inexpensive electricity, so it's not Ours killing us. Medium, medium yeah. and expensive, yeah. Yeah. 17 I know when you get out hour. west, there's a couple yeah. of areas where it's like triple what we yeah. pay, um, where the running the server 24 seven could end up costing you. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you, uh, if you're going to go with one of those tinies or the top tons, do not buy them with memory or storage in them because the failures the failures we've had are basically in two buckets the the memory and storage that comes with them is trash when you buy yep. it from them it's there's no other it's trash it's not it's they use the cheapest stuff in the cheapest stuff they possibly can find uh the other place we've had a failure on them is uh they don't bond to the heat sinks the ones the fanless ones they don't bond the heat they screw up bonding the heat sink to the case sometimes yeah. and they just thermally fail then uh so but those are those large, yeah. the, the ones with the fans in them. The, fans are fine. The, the mini PCs with the fans, those I haven't had fail. No. But back other than, other than bad memory or, memory or SSD. Yeah. The, the SSDs don't have a name on them either. They're, yeah. they're completely, go go it's, just, and they're usually 512. So just go yeah. buy yourself a 2TB. And, and um, I like a lot of them have three, two and three MVME yeah. slots on them. Yeah. It's basically whatever NAND flash fell off the back of a truck. There's usually never a DRAM, <laughs> DRAM cache in it. It's just not, it's performance and write endurance is not great. Yep. Uh, they said, uh, be oh, UK. Yeah. 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 I mean, your power is weird over there anyways. I mean, ring circuits are like the weirdest thing. I, I, I went down a YouTube rabbit hole on ring circuits one day. <laughs> uh, we'll use a service, an older X350 Lenovo server that always supports two and a half disks. Uh, so that's the main reason I will use that for replication. I mean, you can get, if you're, go on eBay, you can buy like no hours on them. Oh, yeah. Small two the, and a half the inch. 10K, uh, yeah. the two and a half. Or, I mean, at that, you only need 7,200 to keep the heat down. But yeah, I'd go buy SAS disks for the thing and not, uh, not SSD, honestly. <laughs> um, how can I collaborate with you and be one of your remote IT resources? Um, uh, I don't cnwr.com slash careers. I think when we have postings up is up to date Yeah, uh, or email your resume to HR at cnwr.com. I believe that address still exists. We'll put you in a pool and if it comes down to it later, we may be there. Yeah. Yeah. We, we hire from time to time. So if, if you're looking for a I job, that would be, I, I don't have anything open right now, but uh, I expect later this year we will have positions open for sure. Yep. There are 26 full-time and one half-time employee here now. Yeah. So we got about 30 of us now and just about us. Yeah. 
we had our all hands meeting uh, today, like I said earlier, and it's just, it's kind of interesting. Like there's just more and more faces here. Uh, running a firewall virtually is my new favorite thing. Uh, the portability and being able to make snapshots outweighs the cons of extra software layer to manage. Um, when it works, it's beautiful. Yeah. I, I like virtual firewalls. The The problem I run into, and this I see in my forums repeated, so I'm new to virtualization and I've never loaded PFSense. My first project is loading PFSense and virtualizing it. Yep. <laughs> and I'm like, trial by fire, as long as you have the fortitude to go through all the learning steps, I yeah. think it's great. The problem is people ask some of the most, like they just don't get it type of questions a yeah. lot. So, yeah. and they yeah. end up exposing things completely wrong. They plug their cable modem right yep. into their virtualization system and yep. not realize that- No VLANs. No VLANs and they've now maybe Bridge cable companies wire their 18 max on your cable modem. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, you run into that. The other things that I tend to see people don't realize they create themselves chicken and egg problems. So like their virtual firewalls down. So now their prox box box doesn't, but then they set up something like LDAP or some sort of integration or SAML integration or some sort of thing where it requires internet access to log into the VM host. And you can't because it's, it, there yeah. are chicken and egg problems. Just avoid those two. Set yeah. it to auto start. There is there you can set yes. on both XCP and GN, VMware and Proxmox and all of them. Set the Proxmox VM to auto start. So um something clever that Wendell did on level one text. He called it the forbidden router. Yeah, the PF <laughs> We did the PF sense with the pass through, but instead of passing it through as an old VM, he passed the drive through and he passed one four port network card through. But what happens is you can go in the BIOS reboot and it'll boot PFSense natively because it's the same card and he's doing a pass through drive. So that's his plan B. He it was a it's that's complicated, but it's fun. I, I mean, to be fair, like the uh, you were just down in the basement with one of our newer employees, and uh, I have a R710 down there that it's my personal stuff. It runs my some web stuff. It runs one of my DNS servers and uh, my mail server. I still run a mail server with Postfix. Yep. I gave uh, up a couple of years yeah, ago with Postfix. I, give up. Uh, I don't, I mean, it's, I don't really use that email at this point, but, <laughs> uh, and it works like it's a virtual PF sense and it works fine. It, it requires, when it fails, fortitude is the right word. Uh, <laughs> Cause now it's like, how do I talk to this thing? Like, how do I get into the VMware host? And then, yeah, it's a whole thing. Yep. This is a fun one. Can I use Kelly Linux to pen test our corporate systems? We are going through an audit. We have never been pen tested. That really is a you question. Like Kelly Linux in the hands of Tom is not nearly Kelly Linux in the hands of Jason. So yeah, I mean, yes, uh, it is a good tool to use. It's whether or not you have the skills to use it. Well, I mean, Kelly Linux is a toolbox. Can you use a toolbox to build a building? Yes. Do you have, do you know how to build a building? Maybe, probably not, right? Like uh, uh, there is no push button, get pen test. It's, uh, there's a lot of skill. The pen tester you hire to do that will probably use Kali Linux yeah. on the back end, but they, uh, the experience does it. I mean, we do that, uh, especially if it's just a limited scope. I would recommend before you start trying to pen test anything, you do a security audit uh, because vulnerability yep. scanning and vulnerability management, if you, on the open source side, uh, you can look at the free version of Nessus. We tend to use the paid version, but you can look at the free version of Nessus or OpenVAS are both good solutions. I think they're both present in Kali uh, and start there. Uh, do not pay for a pen test until you've closed the little hanging fruit because the thing about pen tests is they're time boxed, right? So it's like, you're, you're giving that guy a week or whatever to do whatever damage and whatever he can do. And his goal is to get domain admin and do uh, lateral movement. He will 100% exploit all of the stuff you know is wrong to, to do that. And, and e either scope out the things you know are wrong so they can't use those yeah, or fix them because they are there. They may not, they may spend all their time, poking that hole and then laterally moving and miss the 30 other things that you have wrong. Yeah. You, you really want to use them for the advanced skill. Cause if you just have a bunch of low hanging unpatched things, yeah. it, it's that's why they're time boxes as much as we can find during this much time. Uh, me and Jay did a video together called, are you ready for a pen test? You'll find it on my channel. And we go a little bit more in depth on this as a topic. Uh, Cause it's, it's an important one. Uh, this one's an easy answer. Use Dell gen 14 or HP. Stay away from HPU servers. I just hate them. They take I so long. I don't like 
HP servers to begin with. They take too long to boot. Uh, Jeff from Craft Computing, uh, he has a video to explain all the models and how to figure out which models have their firmware updates behind paywalls and which ones don't. It is a confusing journey that he had to do a video on just as an explainer to HP's poor decisions like that. Dell at least is nice. You can find Dell parts anywhere. The HP Gen 10 is probably newer than, uh, maybe they're about the same age. I, I, my preference, so we sell almost exclusively no. these days. The reason we do that is Dell isn't very channel friendly or at least has a history of not being very channel friendly. I will buy Dell servers every day of the week. Uh, 1-800-945-3355. Like yeah. I, that is the Dell gold support number. I still haven't memorized, right? Like it's, uh, uh, in the end, all of that hardware is commodity. It's all roughly the equivalent to each other. So it all comes down to supportability and the ability to get parts. I tend to find in the Dell world, that seems to be a little easier than the HP world. And you tend to get complete systems and not get shipped a bucket of parts. Yeah. And it's so easy to find the, um, like I said, any used Dell parts, anything you need, you can find that part number on there and find it on eBay in no time at all. I have a NetGate 2100. The system resources are a little low for what would be the best security system to use. Sierra PF Locker, uh, you hit the limit resources. I mean, here I have videos, more recent ones on Snort, which you can also use Sierra Cata. Uh, PF Locker doesn't take up too many resources, but... Uh, caveat there that one table size you yes. typically have to increase you have to increase the table size better. especially if you have a lot of uh, <laughs> if you do geo blocking if you do geo blocking you're gonna need that but it's not like someone had asked uh and this question comes up all the time people asking you well i want a firewall that's going to block all viruses and the reality is most things are encrypted the firewall is going to have a limited unless it's able to fully do ssl inspection it's going to have a very limited view of things it may help with some things um but it, it, it also takes less resources than you think to use something like Snort. My most recent Snort video, one of the things I showed was all the different devices I can have simultaneously using the internet and still not have a problem. Then I show how to break Snort by torrenting. <laughs> so, Yeah, I mean, the big thing there is that the real benefit you get is going to be in your threat feed, right? Yeah. So it's like you really want like the, the value there is like the ET, the emerging threat feed and the Talos feed and the other yep. feeds that are coming in from places that are seeing active command and control and active threats, right? Because as you point out, uh, you, a decent thing, you'll get SNI headers, right? So you'll know what you're talking to, but everything's going to be encrypted. Uh, and none of that matters. If you're not exposing anything up to the Internet and it's all just up on traffic, then yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. NGFW isn't really saving you that much these days. There. No. It's like three years ago. Yeah, yeah, it's just becoming less and less effective. Uh, is MDNS traffic a concern where three VLANs in terms of security performance and device discovery? No, if you use the MDNS and allow cross VLAN discovery, that's all you're allowing. MDS is just kind of brokering the fact that these things exist. Um, but it I, seems like some stuff's moving away from it. Yeah, I, I mean, because multicast is hard <laughs> yeah like i don't think chromecast uses it anymore uh, they um, do they can they uh, it seemed to have broke i don't know if it it's breaks the, all the time yeah that so yeah i don't understand it it's like my phone will be on literally the same wireless network as my chromecast about half the time works and half the time it doesn't right and i can't reproduce why it works one time and doesn't work another time i it don't understand used to work really smooth before an update yep. um I used to have the Chromecast on one VLAN and I could cross VLAN. I have a whole video I did on it and yeah. people, I, I should take the video down because it works extremely inconsistently now. Yeah. Um, it, I, uh, well, I will tell you it works even extremely inconsistently, even if you're on the same, on the same one. one. So <laughs> I don't think it's an multicast DNS problem. No. Nope. You, no. So things to keep in mind there is that multi, depending on how your uh, domain resolution is set up and your domain proxies and other things like that, you do you could be leaking information between VLANs that you may not want to leak, and you just make sure you understand that. Yeah. Uh, Ubiquiti's ecosystem worth the premium price. I don't, I'm not going to call them a premium price, yeah, but so. I guess if you're comparing to MakerTech, yeah. uh, MakerTech, there, there's a yeah. great write up by someone who works at a WISP in my forums, and he, he broke down right down to board revisions, all the problems with MakerTech based on that. It was really, he, the guy says he loves MakerTech, but he goes, there's always, he had some wording that made me laugh. It's like, there's always some secret incantation you're going to find in a forum post that you'll just, someone will tell you to copy and paste it. It'll make no sense, but it'll make the thing work the way you expect it to. Yep. But 
that's the problem. There's always some weird quirk, and then you have some joke. They say it's just Latvian logic of how they did it this way. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know what world we're living in where ubiquity is the premium product. I mean, I guess in terms of support, <laughs> critiques is even worse than ubiquity is, which yeah. is a pretty low bar. Uh, yeah, I, I, for I like uh, they were talking to the guy consulting all day guys so what you know i just want for the back end for the switching i just need 10 gig connected between yeah. four servers maker tick it's inexpensive you can buy a pair of them uh yeah. there's enough documentation you can get that going without much headache yeah and if you and if you're if you don't have to do any layer three because that's one of the secret incantation things yep. as soon as you do layer three it cpu switches everything and the perform and the performance on those way underpowered cpu just goes absolutely yeah. to the toilet uh and as long as you're Things aren't that complicated. I would load SWOS on it and screw router OS uh, and just use it as a layer two switch. Yeah. Point. Yeah. If you, it's, I, I, want, I might do, so I might buy one of the newer ones. Um, it, they have a good value proposition, but it's like 400 bucks for a 16 port 10 gig switch. Yes. Yeah, they have one in the basement. Yeah. They're, they're, there's good and bad with them, though. Um, we have an office person because I don't think Jason has a green thumb, and I know Tom doesn't. <laughs> no, uh, it's actually my mom. Yeah, she's she's all, his mom's also the office manager. Yeah. <laughs> ah, ET on the Netbird video. They added so many improvements. I say it's worth an update to the Kennedy. Yeah, that's actually part of. So because I was traveling, I was at Ubiquity event in Chicago. Then we went to New York, and then just all the different things that came up. Um, I delayed doing the Netbird video, but. That's all that's worked out to their advantage because they just announced that they integrated with Okta and a bunch of other things. So um, I'm excited where Netbird's going. Like I, people keep bringing it up and I've commented because I brought it up in a previous video. I thought it was really cool. Um, awesome open source. That channel did a video on it. That's pretty in-depth. And so did uh, Christian Lempa. Uh, he did a video on it as well. So those are um, that um, question people they want to sponsor a video Nepper does and they sponsored christian lempa's video does that mean i already like the product should i take the money yes or, okay <laughs> i they want to sponsor me for some stuff they they're i like them as an up-and-coming product is there going to be a cnwr con probably not uh you can come see us at msp econ the msp econ msp econ that's where you can come hang out with us uh, you'll find both of us there <laughs> Uh, you because he's getting better with support. They're offering more of it, but you're the, it's not, it certainly has not ever been their strong suit. Hence the reason we do so much ubiquity consulting. And so do so many other people. <laughs> uh, I suck at networking. I'm the only IT guy for 300 people, four sites across the country. I switched all their sites. Ubiquity makes it super easy. Yeah. I'll give them that. That's easy to do. Uh, I know this aged and well discussed. However, uh, do you guys and other MSP style services, UBNT gear, is it always out of stock on the site? How do you even plan out deployment? Uh, Tom has a secret. Yeah. We use, uh, we actually use Chris from Crosstalk. He's got the UI notify thing. So we've used that. Uh, we, what's the vendors we buy from though? Streakwave has them. Um, uh, we, we do have vendors yeah. we can buy in bulk on the back end. Uh, we, I mean, if it's in stock, we usually try to buy it from Ingram. Ingram. Right. Like uh, that's our distributor of choice. And for the common things, it's usually not out of stock. You know, the weird, the things that are tend to be out of stock a lot are some of the, uh, UISP like products, yeah. right? Like the access points are never out of stock. The switches are no. usually pretty good. Things like cameras and door access controllers. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are. I don't think the demand is there for them to do them continuously. So they do runs of them and then they sell out. And yeah. I think that's the actual problem. Whereas like they sell enough the access points, they're just always making them switches too. Yeah. And I just, um, I've been testing the Wi Fi 7 one. I have one of those now. So that's, uh, yeah. You They've got, at the event, they kind of revealed to us, and you've probably seen some teasers on Reddit. They have some new product lines come out. their new switches and things like that and uh, new you know, firewall stuff. So, yeah, they got a lot. I, I like where they're going with it. Um, and that stuff's cheap enough. You just maintain spares. Yeah, we have we have spares of all yeah. this stuff. We do the same thing with Netgate. We got, we got like one of each sitting on the shelf. Um, have you used a Ubiquity Identity? I need a way for people to thank you. Ubiquity with Office 365. I don't know that I would. Man, that is an internal discussion for both that and Synology. Yeah. I don't have a solution for that yet, honestly. That would I... be a good tech support. Like, well, we should build the solution. 
I think the um, – and Kyle, one of our internal team members, uh, he did some testing with the Synology, and I think it went really well, he said. Uh, um, you can – so yes. – I see Willie Howe in here. I think he's tested this as well. I know at Foursquare, where we just did that wireless assessment, they're doing 802.1x, uh, but they're using Radius, right? So, like, I think there's some provision to do NPS and hook it to SAML. Uh, so you can do that. I mean, it's speech Radius. Yeah. That might be an option as well. But yeah, I don't know about the um, the the Ubiquity's identity product is weird. I don't know that I would use it. I don't know. So my... I I like the switches. I like the access points. They've been good. The gateways are okay. The other products, I have been, we, I, I'm not going to say we, I've been burnt <laughs> multiple times by them coming out with the products, us deploying it, and then they just nope it out of existence with no notice or 30 days notice, and then you're screwed. Uh, that I'm very afraid of touching some of those, especially core things like identity. I would be very afraid yeah. that you would put all your eggs in that basket. And then that. like, and then a month from now, they're like, yeah, no, that didn't work out. And they just, it's gone. And then you're screwed. Yeah, Willie. I think Willie too, you, you've taught me and you've chatted about this before. Um, how, how do you feel overall about, do you have customers using this where you tie the Synology to their Microsoft Entra ID uh, so they can then authenticate their users locally. How do you feel about that working? It's something we've been testing. We haven't, I don't think we have um, any, we have a couple of clients that want this. I don't know that we have any yeah, production I mean, right basically, now. Basically, you're talking about Sino? Yeah, the Sino. Yeah, team. so the problem is they're like, we're, we're pushing people to cloud, right? And and so you push them to Entra ID, we, Azure ID join them, and we use Intune and Autopilot and all the other stuff that goes with it. But Man, SharePoint's just not a great solution for some of those things, uh, <laughs> even a little bit. And uh, so we want a solution to be able to support that off on Synology. And we have a really hacky way of doing it, but man, it's really hacky. So we're looking for a better way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yep. So, yep. Yeah. Same problem. Same problem. <laughs> uh, and this is just a yes. This is, this is the thing. Like SSO, I don't have a problem with it. I, yeah. I like it, especially if you heard us mention earlier how many employees we have and you start compounding how many services we have, you multiply yeah. that times employee and you're like, Oh crap, that's a lot to manage. It's just easier to manage things with SSO. And we honestly, most of our SSO these days, it's in two buckets. We have duo for some things and we have 365 or SAML for others. Uh, it's a single centralized source for me to enforce policy, right? Yep. So I have conditional access policies and policies in duo. If you log into our Hulu, for instance, uh, you get a duo with the number match. It's not even number matching. You have to type the little code they send you. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we can set all of those policies. When you don't do SSO, you end up, it's really hard to enforce policy. Yeah. Uh, Synology really wants you to use their C2 identity. It's a great product, but there's a few moving pieces to get yeah. in your work. Product. That's exactly. What, that's what we're testing right now. The, uh, the one, uh, the hacky way that I'm guessing you're doing it, uh, that does <laughs> SAML, we've got it deployed, I think two places and, uh, it's stable in quotation marks. It's stable until it's not. And then when it's not, you're like really scratching your head. Cause it's, uh, it like Kubernetes, it breaks in weird, mysterious ways. Yeah. Uh, sounds just needs to figure out SSO on the apps. Yeah, probably. Yeah. It's not perfect. I love SSO, but it sounds like your big identity isn't, uh, heavily used going to <laughs> stick with local accounts. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem. Yeah. We're not, so our, we're not doing SSO on our, uh, controller. Because yeah. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. I just, it, you know, this is the same thing. What we actually joked about this, uh, when you went to the Ubiquity event, you know, they went through all the products, right? Except for one talk. Yeah. Not a word, not yeah. a mention. Well, and this is the problem. Yeah. And phone systems have a long tail. They're not yeah. even a five year life no. cycle. They're there for, they're there forever. <laughs> we have a client that, uh, we are still trying to get them off of the, I can't even remember the company that made the phone system got bought three times and then just noped out of existence. It's like a box like this in their server room. And it's a traditional key system and companies install these phone systems and they're, they're there for literally 10, 20 years. Right. Mm -hmm. So I can't, it, you, you can't have a solution where you change all their phones out. And then in three years you're like, Oh yeah, nope. Psych. We got to do something completely different now. It, it's too much labor, too much training yeah. and too much. It, it's the training's like, a big part. 
Yep. Like everyone forgets that. And uh, we, you and I were talking about that maybe on the subway or something yeah. in New York that the biggest cost right now for me to implementing a new solution here is training all my people on it. Right. Like, uh, you know, you come in on the MSP side of the house there may be a vendor that's 10% cheaper than what I'm paying now for a given service, but it's like a three year ROI by the time I onboard and train all my people on a 10% savings in most cases. So that's not savings alone. Isn't enough to get me moved to move at our scale. Nope. It just, and it gets worse as you get bigger and in the clients face the same thing. It's, you know, clients like the solutions they have because training non-technical people on a new workflow can be even harder sometimes. Oh, training. Look at that. Yeah. Really, really overblown. Oh yeah, We're clipping our video there behind clipping us. our video behind us. Uh, Ring Central End of Life, the Cisco SPA three hundred threes. Yeah, I mean, How old are those? Uh, yes, <laughs> that those that that is a combination of words I have not heard for many many years. <laughs> but well, that's a good point. I mean, that's the point. They, they're just around forever. They, uh, um, we have mostly stopped using ATAs as much as we can because it's just generally isn't a good time. Yeah. I don't think that Ring Central is the best time either. <laughs> Willie's commenting on that. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, how would you use Ansible for a large campus deployment for Ubiquity? I'm not exactly uh, understanding. I know it's 100% how you would use it. The same way you use it for Arista. Like for. And once you join them all, is it so you can join them? No, it's uh, uh, I want I want infrastructure as code for my switches. I mean, and my access points, right? So I want to be able to define in code what VLANs are where. Yeah, no, that's not going to happen in Ubiquity. No, it won't. That's I mean, not that's it, not their it, business it, model. That's I mean that you really want that more for configuration drift because again at scale, right? Like my buddy is the network manager of U of M Health Systems, and some numbnuts low level guy will log in and move a VLAN to another port and their documentation's wrong and their process wasn't followed or he's doing it <laughs> troubleshooting. You posted that video the other day about temporary. Those things are never oh, temporary, yeah. right? So yeah. uh, the reason you use Ansible on that stuff is, you know, now you have a centralized source of truth. You can do configuration yep. reviews and diffs between configs and all the other cool stuff that comes with it. Yeah. yeah that, and so Unify does have an API, but it's not well documented. Yeah. So I meet people that have spent a lot of time reverse engineering it to get things to work. At some point, it's not the right product for yeah, that. If you yeah. if you have something you wanted to find, because like for example, I do know there's people who run MakerTik. Yeah, I was going to say you could probably do that with MakerTik yeah. pretty well. Yeah, MakerTik's made <laughs> for that, uh, as well as once you get up to yeah. the big boy uh, Arista. tools, Arista, Arista, and then like the Cisco, the uh, Nexus stuff all does it. Yeah, anything sports in that kind of. Yep. Well, this is a lot of planning here. Everything's great until SSO stops working. You can't get into your office server room with access to fix the problem. Yeah, that's the Facebook yeah, problem. Yeah. We need a break glass <laughs> account. We you, have them. Yes, break glass account. That's the term. If that's not part of your plan and you have not tabletop this, you've done it wrong. <laughs> In it, that same, you can substitute. SSO going down with 18 other things going down, right? When Office 365 goes down, the world stops working. You can use Ansible if you install OpenWRT on them. Yeah, that's only yeah. possible on the older models. There's actually a lot of, there's a, um, uh, you can reflash because the Ubiquity devices are based on OpenWRT. Yeah. Okay. So there are people who have like updated firmwares that you can send them if you want to take them and make them standalone WRT devices again. Uh, so is the um, what's the other one? Alta Labs. They're yeah. They're based I think on a good amount of them. A lot of the they all start with that as like their framework. Yeah. They don't need to reinvent the Wi-Fi wheel. They they start with OpenWRT and then they it's, add yeah, their post APD and yeah. Yeah, they toss all their sauce on top. Uh, have you used dealt with any issues with Entry ID, authentic key users, uh, and access to on-prem stuff? It's kind of what yeah, we're talking about with the Synology the problem. We're talking about. So the two problems we have with Entra ID right now are you can't join servers, although in theory that's supposed to somehow get fixed in the future. And uh, well, that is that is the problem. Like there's no real good way to support servers to uh, Azure AD. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to call it Azure AD also. Uh, 
So if you have on-prem infrastructure, it's not a great solution. You can use AEDS, which probably has a new name now. It's probably changed names twice since it was called that Yeah. Uh, to try to get around some of that stuff. But man, it's like you very quickly get down a rabbit hole of you end up just spinning up a domain controller in Azure and being done with it. I have four firewalls, each at a different location. My main firewall has free radius installed. I want to have all three remote firewalls contact the main for authentication. Yeah, that's fine. You can. Yeah, um, you can't do that. And if you want to make tunnels go down, you have no local survivability, but that's fine. Yeah. Uh, worth noting too, Tailscale is an easy way to do it, um, to get all everything talking. I've recommended Tailscale to a lot of people because it's built into PFSense. Considering 90% of Alta employees come from UI, no surprise. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they've just um, they've got one former NetGate person, <laughs> and they've got a bunch of all the other staff on LinkedIn are all people that used to work at Unify. So shocking. It's based on the same thing. <laughs> oh, what else was there? Hybrid is limited. Windows autopilot is amazing. Change your auditing processor to better. Oh, that's only because you haven't used AmiBot. Yeah, we use AmiBot. Uh, I looked at autopilot. The problem is the volume you need to be able to get them enrolled from the factory. And if you can't get them enrolled from the factory, it's a pain in the butt. Yeah. Uh, but if you, AmiBot, completely not sponsored, uh, they just make a cool product. They yeah, make um, a cool product. They can do things that they go above and beyond what uh, autopilot can do. I mean, it's it does some things Autopilot does, plus some things Intune does. Problem with Intune and all of those solutions, Autopilot's neat. I like it. I would definitely use it over WDS, uh, but we've switched, again, to mostly Amibot. Uh, problem with Intune is that check-ins are periodic. Like, there's no... Yeah. Like, you may not check in for a half hour. Right. Uh, UCG Ultra or x86 PC or MPF Sense? x86 or MPF Sense. I'm not... I'm still... I still favor PFSense over uh, the Unify Firewall series. Mm -hmm. They have more features in PFSense, more expandability, yeah. more flexibility. So I'm still going to be PFSense over that for a long time. Microsoft Ansha Connect Sync. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's it. Yeah. Microsoft's naming conventions. It's like Microsoft just has a grab bag of six names at any point and they name all their products by just grabbing random combinations out of the bag. And then you can't, we can't even speak a common language because it's all just same words. It's, yeah, it drives you crazy. Uh, does XCG support nested, uh, nested virtualization? Well, the wife is not going to like six hosts in the guest bedroom. Um, you can do nested virtualization. Does it do it well? It seems like when you nest hypervisors and other hypervisors, you've you've now run to the edge case of problems. It, it can work, but there's yeah. always some. There always seems to be some tuning. I know there's a bug in Hyper-V or some problem. There's some support not available in XCPNG to get nested Hyper-V it, working. It's something to do with page tables. Yep. It's uh, uh, it depends on how many of those features that your product uses, and yeah, it it can work. It works fine if you're labbing, right? If you're, I would not would not do in production. Yeah, no, yeah, it's completely a lab thing. At some point, even myself, because I just got sick of doing it, um, I just run. I still, I have a handful of mini PCs, and I have some older PCs. You can find old used PCs are easier to test on without yeah, the headache. We, we were talking about that when you were down here what last Friday. That sometimes it's easier to use a PC than a server, even because of how long boot times are. Yeah, and I did say PC not server, and it's exactly what Jason yeah. said. Who wants to wait eight minutes for a stupid boot? Because a Numa, like a hundred percent. So all of that. Almost the entirety of that long boot problem comes down to uh, multi-socket things and configuring NUMA and the fact that the BMC has to boot and a bunch of other stuff has to boot before it initializes the CPU. Yep. Uh, how many endpoints do you need to start looking for a product like Emubot? Uh, I don't know that might answer. Be a, I don't know what their minimum is. Uh, we're well above it. Uh, I don't know. Talk to them. Come to MSP Geekon. Talk to them. Yeah, come on. Yeah, no excuse. You're literally on everything I do. Yeah. <laughs> so if you don't come to MSP Geekon, I'm going to seek you out. Uh, what's your opinion on network virtualization products that use uh, yeah, VXLAN? Cool. Yeah. I mean, those things are neat. Uh, yeah. It's like VRFs are great. VXLAN is awesome. Uh, a lot of people fake it by just running GRE tunnels over everything. Like, net, it. Those are cool problems or cool products that solve cool problems. That is a use case for MTUs above 1500. Yep. Uh, because you, you know, that virtualization requires things. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm a fan. Uh, um, spy networks, all those. Yeah. 
I did a video as well on the SD-WAN features of XCPNG, which supports both encrypted GRE tunnels or not and or VXLAN. Uh, it'll do when you build the network adapters, it doesn't want you to build them both at the same time. You either build one or the other, but it creates a network adapter that can go across all the hosts or cross pools. So you can actually uh, stretch yep. them across data centers. You can have a pool in one data center, pool yep. in another, and have a, a VXLAN across all of them. That's all That's all built in. Uh, I'll be there, signed up right away. I'm doing the Emibot pre-day thing too. Perfect. Cool. And someone says, uh, or someone looked uh, it up for us. Just make sure you tell Sarah, Tara that I said she sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, maybe even the 5K. Well, you can join Jason on that. Tom doesn't run very well. I'm going to make Ben run, my trainer. Uh, I have not forgotten. He was supposed to run at uh, at our event in Phoenix. He did not. So now I told him, make sure you bring your running shoes to Phoenix or to uh, Orlando. What is it? MSPGeekCon.com. Yep, Someone... yep. We got like four minutes. We yep. gotta wrap. Yeah, we're going to wrap in four minutes. We'll get those last questions in I here. I got a meeting with Finn. He's got a meeting with Finn. Uh, MSP Geek. Con.com is on the screen here. It's in the it's in the chat here. Uh, where and when? Oh, it's uh, uh, Orlando, May nineteenth through twenty second, I believe. Yes, nineteenth to twenty first. Okay, nineteenth to twenty first in Orlando. All the details are there. The, the Rosen Center. Yep, uh, they are not sold out. Yeah, the hotel is not sold out either. So if it if the booking link shows sold out, just call. Uh, the hotel software they use for the booking platform is the worst I've ever come across. So, yeah. yep. And you can still buy tickets. They're worth it. If you ask around, if you're in the MSP community and you ask around, you may be able to find somebody that can get you a discount code to get the early bird pricing. Uh, or you, if you ask around enough, you may be able to find somebody that has extra tickets. You just sold a bunch of Emmy subscriptions, but no credit for it. Hey, I'll get Dan, I'll get Darren to sponsor the yeah. channel <laughs> or actually I should reach out to what's her name. Tara. Yeah, they may be on a sponsor. I'm going to text her. Say, hey, we just talked about you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, Amy Bot is definitely a cool product. Um, we have a list and we need to update it. It's mostly accurate. Yeah, that there's me, a couple things that have changed, but not very much. Yeah, uh, I posted it in my forums. It's our client defense matrix. It's just all the list of tools we use. We're always open about that. Um, it's not some special secret. What is Amibot? It's an automated tool that managed service providers use to make it easier to deploy systems um, and software yeah. and software. Yeah. It, so it's, it does like basically insert USB key when you're installing windows or at the OOB and there's like instructions that just get it to enroll. And then it does all the software installation. We have packages that remove the blow oil that come on OS. It, it can even do offline domain join, which I think is a super cool feature. Yeah. Offline domain join is a really cool feature. Yeah. Um, are you the ones that got Tara to do the LinkedIn challenge thing? I am. Yeah. Jason pushed her. And then she pushed Jason today or something. I yeah, said. she made me do a video today. She's like, yeah, I'm posting a video in two weeks. Yeah, we all, we all, what was it? It was the Contia. We were all talking. We were yeah. like, we just told her, go do it. Jason's like, really? And then she's like, no, no. And then I'm like, do it now. Do it today. Yep. And she did. And she did. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, do a feature comparison um, on there. Yeah, I mean, depending on what you're doing, Intune, I mean, it's probably already included in the subscription you have. And Intune works fine. Uh, the nice thing about Emmy is that it's got a store, right? So if you use something like Chocolatey, it's like Chocolatey on steroids, right? Yeah. So it's like somebody's already written the recipe to install Adobe and keep it up to date. It's got a bunch of rules and stuff you can do around what gets installed. And I mean, offline domain join is just the most amazing thing ever because, you know, I, you guys were building VPN tunnels back to clients when you were building yeah. PCs out. And it's like, I don't want to have to maintain VPN tunnels to clients. So it it basically talks to the domain controller being an agent, provisions the user account, shares whatever necessary keys. And then like magically the computer is just on the domain. And when it shows up, it's there. It works. Simple magically. as that. Uh, we don't use an imaging server. Nope. Nope. It's not needed. You just yep. load Windows and you kick off the ME script yep. for that client. We used Done. to do it. Uh, we used to do WDS. Uh, before that, we were using, I think, way back in the day, we were using Ghost. You guys were using something similar to Ghost. Um, we used Fog. Okay. Yeah. Years I ago. used Fog too for a Fog while. Fog is cool. I mean, it's long, is that goes it back got a long really time. really hard to do in Windows 7 and Windows 10 because yep. the SID and stuff. And, yeah. By, by way, 
Windows 7 was the last imaging yeah. system we had. After yeah. Windows 7, we just said this is like, it isn't worth it. All those agents would show up as the same agent, and then you're spending troubleshooting that for the rest of your life. Yeah. Okay. Uh, My guy's sitting in the meeting, so I okay, cool. Go. Hand you, me the go. No, hand me the. No, you can't have it. You... <laughs> so you don't join the meeting from afar. Yes. Uh... <laughs> just leave it there. It'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Peace. All right. Later. He's got to go. I'll go shortly. I, I just got to beat traffic. That's my thing. There's no traffic here in Toledo. Well, there is. There is a little bit north of here. <laughs> uh, so is anybody in any area that works as AP? You know, right. I don't. I mean, we use Huntress is our primary. So Huntress is kind of our go-to for things like that. Um, for AV. So Huntress is Sentinel One currently. So I can look this way while I'm looking at the laptop. Uh, we do not use uh, 8021. We don't use any extra auth here, just your standard WPA. Uh, have you had an uptick in migration requests for each XCB due to the recent changes in our pricing? Um, migration requests from, I'm assuming you mean from VMware. And yes, we are doing a lot of VMware migrations. Hey there, gents. Uh, let's see. Love your content. Learned a lot much from you. Uh, thanks for taking the time and effort to produce great content. Searching for the latest guides on PF Blocker and G and PF Sense. Yeah, I do have a, uh, I think my PF Blocker video is just from last year. There's not much that's changed that I can think of from last year to this year. Yeah, I believe Auto Elevate is uh, one of them as well. I need a list of your software and services, you guys, so we can check it out. Uh, go in my forums and type in client defense. I think that should find it for you. I did a video, I think it's called the client defense matrix. Um, so if we go to let's see, what is that? Uh, I may have to pull it up from the forums. It's in my forums. That's where I have all the things. There we go. I can, it is, it is called in my forums, client defense matrix. So easy to find, uh, easy for you to Google search that uh, or just search in my forums. Uh, can you move your disks into a new NAS of Synology and update the OS? I don't know. I think Synology supports that. I don't know what ver what version it won't work from, though. Like, how old of a Synology NAS before the new Synology NAS that when you do it, it doesn't work? I don't really have that answer. When self hosting your own Bitwarden server, do you have to pay for each user? Yes. You still, you still have to get the license from them when you do the self hosting. Um, the licensing, they, they now have a, when I first did the videos, they didn't have this. But they do now, they have a licensing sync server. The way you had to sync it was you would buy them through the portal online. Then you would download the license and upload it to your locally hosted server. Uh, currently have migrated around 80 VMs out of 350 to XCP and G VMware. Smooth sailing so far. Awesome. So you're, you're, you're moving right along with it. I, like I said, our success rate has been really high. Um, it seems like the ones built from OVA don't want to transfer over. I think that's the, I think that's what we figured out is the common denominator for what does or doesn't work, um, in terms of that. Cool. All right. Well, I'll do this for five more minutes, last five minutes of questions and then it's, I see a break in the rain. I have to walk from the building. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll give people a quick view for those wondering. This is what our beautiful downtown area looks like. So I can, the, uh, it's a nice rainy day. It's actually, 
my my client earlier was from the uh, from the UK, and they they're like, "Hey, your weather looks like mine." <laughs> Ah, uh, fun stuff. I actually plan to come down here a little bit more often, and we're going to do some more videos from this office, uh, essentially. I, I I have a video where I think I had an office tour in here. I, I want to wait till we fit. Our office is a little bit plain. It's actually nice. Uh, it just, we don't have much on there. Like, there's this wall should say, like, CNWR on the back or something like that. So that's one of the goals is to come up with a better branding um, and, like, you know, tweak the office a little bit. So then we'll do, then I'll do a walkthrough. I've done a walkthrough before in one of my live streams. Uh, do you recommend Unify Enterprise or Pro Max switches with other firewalls, watch card and use with Azure AD on-prem Windows AD? Um, you know, we have a lot of consulting we do with people who love their access points and switches like we do, but don't use their firewalls. And that's the, the category we're in. I mean, we have people that are using their firewalls. They're not our go-to right now. Uh, PF Sense is popular, but we've got people, we've got some clients, let's see, fan them are using 48. I don't really care much for WatchGuard, but I know some people like them. Uh, so if they, they work fine, I mean, I, I don't have any problems or compatibility issues with insert name of your favorite uh, firewall and unify uh, switches. They seem to work well. The only exception for a long time, and this was a well-documented problem that I don't know what the problem was. There was a bug with the sonic wall and the Wi-Fi. It's really weird. It was a DHCP bug that was very repeatable, but the workaround was just confusing. I don't remember what we, what we had to do to fix it. I think it's been resolved, but it exclusively was that people would blame the Unify equipment and granted that was in the mix. But the weird thing about the Sonic wall problem was it just wouldn't hand out DHCP addresses, but you could statically set everything and it worked fine or simply put a DHCP server on the network and it would hand out addresses fine. It was only the Sonic wall would have some communication problem with it. It was a weird issue. Uh, one of the other channels in a video on setting up OpenSense with transparent firewalls, the internet with their Dream Machine Pro seemed cool. Yeah, I seems cool, not something I'd ever probably do in production. Uh, what is the best way to connect a single computer that has a public IP uh, and is on a remote? Was the best way to connect a single computer that has a public IP? I mean... I think we should, we should laugh. He ping me on that one. I'm not, a, I need a, a more expanded question there. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure hundred percent what you're asking for that. <laughs> I know there's a deeper question here somewhere. We need to do another video together. If you, if you don't follow the bearded IT dad, he does a lot of, uh, IT. He's, he's a genuine network engineer and, uh, as, as a fun story, check out his channel. <laughs> uh, what's the difference between the Enterprise line and a Pro Max? I couldn't, they have that, they have a matrix that describes them better on Unify. Uh, ultimately, it comes down to features and whether or not you need those other features that come on there. Those features are all listed out. They got a, they've been updating their site with a better matrix to kind of describe the different products. I couldn't name them off the top of my head though. Tail scale is uh, always a good suggestion. Just fly out here. Fly out here and hang out. There's there's the solution. Come on to Detroit. <laughs> or I, I'm in Toledo right now, but this is 40 minutes from Detroit. I wouldn't mix both. Why would you mix the X86 and the UC Ultra? I would... I don't understand mixing both. I mean, you can. I just don't... I don't have a reason to do that. Think of Apple. Each has a little more horsepower than the previous. Well, I mean, the one has the cool blinky lights and the other one doesn't. <laughs> I'm still soul searching, trying to find an SDN. Uh, so interesting, but choosing a solution to focus on as my network specialty, like you mentioned, SDN seems very fitting, uh, but also using NSX. Yeah. 
I mean, I don't, I don't like the term SD WAN uh, as a product name because it encompasses too many products. SD WAN is a marketing term. You always have to get the more specific. So cool, SD WAN. You're talking about this category of products. It's not telling us what product or what solution uh, that you're actually trying to do. So like Tailscale, Netbird, and um, Zero Tier are all considered SD WAN, but at the same time, the more specific name for those type of networks is overlay network. So overlay networks are a subcategory, if you will, of SD WAN. But you can also look at bonding solutions where you have multiple WANs and you have an SD WAN solution that merges them together for a more seamless failover. That's also a SD WAN solution, but you're now trying to bond connections together. So now it's a different subcategory of SD WAN. So there's, and you can just keep going down these rabbit holes like that. Have you tested Unify Hosting Controller? I noticed you get Unify OS, uh, but only Network App. I'm, I guess you will get more protect. Like, I, yeah, I've done a video about hosting controllers and I did review it. I compared them to Hostify. So uh, just for a baseline comparison, I it worked. I, I, I don't have any problem with the Unify hosted controller. It's just, you know, I usually self-host. So these aren't something I usually use. Uh, and I like Riley from Hostify. I like their hosting as well. Uh, I, and I do a comparison of what you get between each of them. So... Hopefully that answers that question. All right. Well, I'm going to end this here. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I will be doing another live stream. You'll find, I will, I'll share that in my, um, I got it because I don't have a social link for it right now. Uh, I'm doing another live stream on another channel and it's with a friend. So that will be today. I would say a uh, hacking friend that I have. Infosec Pat. Let me see if I can pull it up before I leave. That's going to be at 7 p.m. EST. So I'll, but InfoSec Pat's a more recent friend I made and I'll be doing it. So let's see, I'll throw that in here and I'll throw it up on the screen. Uh, yes, I'm hanging out with Pat. So we're going to do we're going to do a stream together as well. So that's going to be at 7 p.m. EST. It is currently three o'clock EST. And my goal now is to beat traffic because it from where I'm at at the CNWR Toledo headquarters is about a 45 minute drive to my house. So, yes. And Cody, thank you. Got your message. Uh, yes, that's awesome. I will. Um, I will reach out to them. Yeah, what time is it now? It is 3.13 EST. So I have a, my next live stream is four, well, just a little less than four hours from now. So, all right. Well, thanks everyone and take care.